Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In today's episode, I welcome a local Oregon entrepreneur who teamed up with her husband to start a salt company. And in that conversation, we discuss brand guidelines. What is a brand guideline? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? Again, let me start out by saying I am not a marketing guru. I took a few marketing classes at Portland State where I met my wife, and then she proceeded to kick my butt in negotiations the following semester. But that's for another time. I'm an entrepreneur. I want to take small ideas and scale them into large ideas that make a profit. A brand guideline is a document that details a company's visual identity, along with the rules and the guidelines in a public-facing communication. Brand guides set forth rules for official logo usage, font type and color, typograph and tone, and along with the brand's mission statement, positioning, identity, and values per masterclass. Now, a brand guide is quite inclusive of the entire company, and it starts with the mission statement. The brand guide can help ensure that all of the content created is working towards the goal or goals set forth by the mission statement, the company's true north. It can also include color palettes the company will use and the combinations in which they will be used, how the logo will be governed, web page, print ads, radio ads, etc. It is a guide to help build a marketing plan, but that is not all. It outlines typograph, which is the art of procedure of arranging type or processing data and printing from it. It is the taglines, the blogs, the website links. It helps make sure all those things also follow the brand guide down to the space in between the dotted I. If in fashion or sales, it is the guide that helps determine what styles or products to be phased in or out. Hold on to long term enough and it may actually be phased back in like plaid or polyester. A brand strategy goes so far to identify buyer persona. Persona is a user-centered design and marketing is a fictional character created to represent a user type that might use a site, brand, or product in a similar way. Marketers may use personas together with marketing segments where the quantitative personas are constructed to be representative of a specific segment. For example, my target audience, my segment, is 18 to 55 educated business leaders and inspiring business leaders. That is who I am trying to target. On Canva, I have a certain font and color I use. Although I have a very loose brand guideline, I have one. And a brand guide helps create consistency. And that is why it is important. A consistent brand becomes recognizable. It creates immediate recognition with the target audience. It helps the brand stay focused on introducing new products or services. And it's easy to forget the little things when the big things get bigger. But most importantly, it helps bring brand value. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. When there is a cohesive message, colors, font, and identity, it increases the perceived value. It creates a professional and reliable appearance. A brand customers can rely on. A brand guided by principles with a little bit of salt. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest is a tech sales leader with over 15 years of experience in finance, strategy, sales, and entrepreneurship. From Microsoft to Micro Size Salt, she is the co-founder of Portland Salt Co. Please welcome Becca Christensen. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Becca Christensen, the owner of Portland Salt Company. Becca, how are we doing? I'm great. Thank you. I'm excited. This I'm is excited. my first pos- podcast. Okay. I like it. First podcast. <laughs> We're getting there, folks. We're going to get there. <laughs> so 
So introduce the world. Who is Rebecca? Who is Becca Christensen? Before we get into Portland Salt Company, let's introduce the world to you. Awesome. So first and foremost, um, I'm a mother to two incredible kids. They're vivacious, they're high energy, they're amazingly smart and curious. I'm the wife of a college sweetheart. Both of us graduated from University of Oregon. I am a passionate foodie and entertainer, big wine enthusiast, um, and really a lover, uh, lover of global travel. So for me, you know, one of the most fulfilling moments is a full dinner table with amazing foods, friends, family, and conversation. Nice. So now tell me about Portland Salt. I'm actually excited because you brought me some, so I'm going to, I got to use it. (laughs) I've seen your Instagram photos, which folks, let me just tell you right now, if you please go follow Portland Salt Company on Instagram because they are mouth watering photos. Like they are amazing in the videos, like the way you use TikTok. But first tell me about the company. Okay. So Portland Salt Co. is, it's a passion project for us. And we're really a company um, that is a salt-based seasoning company. At the end of the day, we eat a lot of food and we fundamentally believe that artful seasoning starts with salt. So um, what we've done is we use the best of the best Pacific Northwest sea salt. We blend that with other spices um, and create these seasonings that enable a home cook to have access to amazing flavors in a super simple to use way. Um, We're influenced by the global travel that my husband and I have been able to do for the past few decades, but these are really seasoning blends that are honed for the home chef, so it's super easy and versatile for you to bring into your home kitchen and create incredible flavor and great memories for those of you, for those around the table. Nice. Now, what, what, what kind of started the idea? Why salt? It's a really good question. It's it's almost like we've had like three parallel things come together over the past decade. I'm going to start with um, for those that may have young kids. There is a book that's called uh, it's called What Do You Do with an Idea. So this has been something that's been kind of inside of us, brewing you know over years of time, and then at one day it just became. Uh, pretty unavoidable, I guess I would say. <laughs> um, so about the time we were having our firstborns, so this is 2014, uh, my husband's favorite seasoning went off the market. We view steak as a celebratory meal, birthdays, engagements, dinner parties, like it just was our go-to. And he always had the steak seasoning, seasoning that he used and it was gone one day. And he was like, okay, I've got to figure out how to make my own blend that we can use as our go-to. So he spent years kind of refining exactly where we wanted to go with that. And, you know, even jokingly, we called it Portland Steak Salt. Back in the days, we would camp and we would take, you know, jars of this salt. And so it had a name long before we had a company, which is which is kind of funny. And then, you know, as we all experienced with COVID, we were isolated from yeah. family and friends and could no longer host these dinner parties, which we were super passionate about. And we started to have friends reach out. Can you ship us your steak salt? We're missing your dinner parties. And uh, so we started shipping that. And it gave us some confidence and validation that we had something that people liked. And then I would say the third thing that kind of all came in parallel to the moment we started the company was COVID for, for me personally was an opportunity to reassess my life. What am I passionate about? What are the things that drive and fuel me? And um, I spent a lot of time either on the pavement running, reflecting on what, you know, really, really gave me joy. And that was, I wanted to put passion and energy behind a business, behind a food business, because that's where my heart is. And so all of those three things together and kind of that idea permeating over time and then building into something I couldn't avoid anymore. I came home one day and told my husband, we're starting a company. (laughs) So, you know, we're going through it. You know, it's kind of the old saying, the the fastest way through a man's heart is through their stomach, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> I completely agree. So, so you decided, you know what, we're going to go through this route. Did you just grassroot finance it or did you go for venture capital? You're in the middle of the pandemic. How'd you, how'd you end up financing it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so both my husband and I have full-time careers in the high-tech industry. Um, and we've been on both the finance sales financing today Um, You know, we just got back from an incredible industry event called the Fancy Food Show in New York City, and there's a lot of people willing to help and invest, and a lot of people, you know, in that industry willing to help, um, you know, grow your business um, in terms of how you need. So that's been a big part of um, learning about what opportunities are going to be available when we do kind of grow beyond the ability to self-finance. Nice. And so, you know, you're going through the pandemic. You decide to start a company. 
how do you brand and market a company during a pandemic? Like usually you're going out to road shows and doing, you know, farmers markets. How do you sell a food product when everybody's at home? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I had these aspirations. I said on Instagram um, more than I would like to admit. (laughs) And I'm easily influenced by a lot of these incredible brands that are building direct-to-consumer brands. So to be honest, our vision was to grow a direct-to-consumer brand to begin with. We wanted to build this brand that had a loyal following and, you know, was easy to transact and purchase through direct consumer on our websites and market through social media to, you know, grab the attention of consumers. Um, But that actually proved to be a lot harder than I expected it to be. So um, in terms of the branding, we hired a marketing team really quickly. We said we need to define what our brand vision is. What is our strategy? What are what's our mission? What are our guiding principles? Who are our customers and how do we identify where to place investments in attracting those customers and those buyers? And so we worked with the marketing team. That was one of the first things we did was build a brand guide. This is really you know, our guiding principles, we come back to every time we have a conversation about how we're going to market, how we're going to represent the brand. And we worked with people that are smarter than us to guide us uh, to get us there. So for the folks at home that may not be aware of what a brand guide is, give them a little idea. What is a brand guide and, and whatever, maybe provide a little bit of insight of what's in your brand guide. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, in our brand guide, we have our mission, Um, And our mission is to make it easy for home chefs to bring fine dining level flavors and memorable culinary experiences to their kitchen. We've got our vision, um, which is really to become a household name for your seasoning, you know, category. Um, We've got our value prop. Like what is the unique value proposition that we bring to customers and what differentiates us from the other spices or salts on the shelf um, that you could find today? Who are our target customers and why do they buy? And then really the positioning in the market to help us, you know, I didn't really know the power of this brand guide because I've never been a marketer. I've been on the finance and sales side, but having something that is your kind of core guiding principles to come back to in every single thing you think about really centers the brand and it helps build an identity um, that's very clear and, and ultimately becomes clear to the customer. What are some examples of, you know, situations that you've maybe faced that you had to kind of rely back on the brand, brand kind of guidelines that you created? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, sitting in this interview is a great example. I wanted to refer back to the brand guide to say, I need to make sure every single talking point is really on point with who we want how we want to represent this brand. We did a a great um, partnership with RD Winery and Napa Valley Winery, and they put us in their foodie box. So they do um, a quarterly um, six bottle, you know, wine, um, curated wine selection, and they put a foodie element in to give people some opportunities to explore different flavors. Right, right. Putting that together, we were also interviewed, had a big Q&A, and also, you know, had to build kind of who this brand was and why it was um, important and why RD Winery reached out to us. So referring back to that brand guide is a good example of how we just kind of keep the guardrails on who this company is and how we message. Yeah, you know, one, one actually had a recently, uh, the Chosen Wine family, or Chosen Family Wine. I listened to that May podcast. Bring, I think that'd be a great uh, connection with you because... Their wine is impeccable. Uh, and, you know, be kind of they're local, right? Yeah. As well. Now, is this your you and your husband's first business? It's our first business. So, um, I think I mentioned I'm in the high tech space. Both of us have been in high tech since graduating college. So, 17 years in corporate oh, uh, jobs, you know, in finance, sales, strategy capacities, and this is the first time we're going out on our own. What feels different? Oh gosh, that there is um, nobody to tell me how to do it. It is completely autonomous decision making. It, um, I heard this funny thing. They said, you know, you give up your nine to five job because you don't want to work. You know, you don't want to be becoming to, you know, a corporate environment. And instead you find a 24 hour exactly. job, right? It's, <laughs> yes, so you do. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's amazing in that you get to make all the decisions. At the same time, you're accountable for every decision you make. Yeah, that's very true. And, and you know, there's a lot of late nights by yourself. Oh my gosh. I, I was thinking about that on the, on the way over to the podcast, you know, you give up Netflix and wine evenings and you spend those evenings packing inventory, creating shipping labels, building brand guides, you know, recording, 
uh, reels for Instagram, all of these things. And I know that they're, you're giving up. It's, it's short-term pain for long-term gain. So that's, that's kind of my mindset when I think about that's a very good all way of to those put hours. It. I like it. I like it. Short-term mean for long-term gain. I like it. Now, what, how, what would you say, you know, you've been in the tech world for a long time, uh, moving into the entrepreneurship world. What has been hard? Uh, There's been a number of things that have been really hard. I think the hardest part to be completely transparent was making the decision to get started. Mm, Um, You know, self-doubt creeps in. um, Am I too old to pivot? Can I pivot to a completely different industry from high tech to food? Um, Are my skills applicable across industry? That was the hardest part. But then beyond, you know, once we got over that and made the commitment, it was like, we're not looking back. We're moving forward. But then you need to understand a whole new industry. How do sales channels work? How do resale and wholesale channels work? How do you build a customer shopping experience on a a platform like Shopify? How do you create uh, a demand for your product when there's been no demand, when you're going from zero? You know, all those kinds of things become the hard parts in terms of building a business. You know, you mentioned self-doubt. And I think a lot of things um, entrepreneurs face, and people in general, right? Uh, that imposter syndrome, that feeling of, man, I, I'm really having this moment of uncertainty. How did you get over that? How did you kind of build up? Because I feel like you're super confident right now. Like, hey, you got this. <laughs> like, you know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> oh, it's a journey. I mean, I am a consistent learner. And, you know, I I would say building towards that confidence is really about pausing and celebrating all of the small wins. You know, it's pretty often to, we move fast as a, as a, you know, human, a set of humans, we move really fast and we're always on to the next. And I think every time we stop and celebrate, we just brought a product into market. I cannot even believe we literally created a physical product we're going to put on a store shelf. Celebrating that moment and building that confidence helps you kind of look back and go, we've got this. we got to keep moving forward. Um, I Self-doubt continues. Uh, my husband's even more confident. So he really doesn't have that, that, you know, kind of look back and go, are we doing the right thing? He's like, we're doing the right thing and we're going to keep growing and we're going to grow as fast as we can. Um, but I think it's a matter of listening to that self-doubt, understanding is it a valid point of self-doubt or not, and then figuring out why I'm feeling that way and what can I do to go and shift and kind of keep progressing forward without letting that stall me out. Yeah. And, and you know, what is, has there anything been easy during this transition? You know, I think there's been a few things that have been really surprising. Um, first and foremost, working alongside my husband. Um, you know, we've, We've never worked together before. We're very different but complementary people. We have similar interests, but we operate very differently. And that's been easy, and it's been fun. And I think the um, the great thing about working with somebody that you're so close to is appreciating like some of the differences. He's got a, a thought process around a strategy and growing this and scaling this business, and I've got a thought process around – you know, our sales engines and the relationships and the key partnerships that we have opportunities to go after. And just those differences has proved to be really amazing and easy, which is great. And then I would say what I, what's also been easy, and I had no idea that this would be easy, is there is a food community in, you know, your local area with makers just like you or ideas just like you. And if you lean into them, there's a lot to learn. And they're willing to share. There's a lot of really good people who are willing to share their information and their knowledge and their insight with you. And I wonder why. Why do they want to help me? But people do want to help you. And so that's been easy. It's helped guide us on a lot of big decisions that we would have probably gone a completely different direction on. Yeah, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about networking. How important has networking been to the success of the Portland Salt Company? Huge. I cannot express how fundamental networking is, whether it's personal or professional. There are relationships that you never even know where they're going to take you. Um, So one of the things um, when we were getting started, somebody recommended the OSU Food Innovation Lab. It's a lab here in Portland. I had no idea, but there are a bunch of researchers and a bunch of, you know, food developers and recipe developers and go to market that are just there to help this local ecosystem build food products in Portland. 
I was not aware of this as well. Please tell me more. This is, sounds so cool. It is so cool. And there is a woman, and her name is Sarah Masoni. We stumbled upon her. It was a wonderful accident. And she actually had a write-up in the New York Times calling her the million-dollar palette. She's behind a lot of the flavors and building the salt and straw business. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what an incredible resource. So if you're open to picking somebody's brain, and um, and Sarah was really good. You know, she gave us enough information to then have to go solve for a bunch of problems on our own, which was perfect. It was like, I'm going to give you this much, but you go put in the hard work. And then once you've put in all that hard work and you've still got blockers or questions or, you know, you need mentorship, come back to me. But I know you're committed because you've put in this hard work. But, you know, just kind of back to the networking question, it is um, it is so incredibly important. And, it, and it's important to happen organically, you know. You have to build these relationships with people that – that both people get something really special out of. And, and once you do, it just unlocks so many opportunities. Somebody knows this person and, you know, now we're having a conversation with a large olive oil producer about mixing in our pita salt, which is a, is a tar in more of a condiment. None of that happens without just kind of opening those doors to those opportunities. You know, you talked about the importance of networking, but you've also mentioned your husband and your kids quite a bit. How important has your family been in kind of building this business with you? I reflected a lot on this um, over the past few months. And uh, I was sitting in a a meeting with a woman we're bringing on to help us do some marketing work. And my daughter was doing an arts and craft project right next to me. And I was sitting on my PC and, you know, taking the phone call. And I get off and she had been listening to every word I've been saying. And then she had all these questions. Is she joining the company? What is her role going to be? And she's an eight year old. (laughs) I love this. I love it. She's as spunky and, and, and wicked smart. So, you know, it has been such a privilege to show them how to build something. We've been in this corporate world and they know mommy and daddy work hard, but they've never got to really see what we do because we're behind a PC or we're Mm, on an airplane, you know, work they can't fully understand. But now they're building boxes with us. They are helping us unload pallets of inventory into our storage facilities. They are helping us think about new new products. They're helping us name our products and giving us insight. And then they come and support us at all these local events that we're doing. And I'm, you know, so proud to be able to do this and show them and give them a gift of showing how to start and build and work really hard for a dream. You know, I love that piece about it because I think kids keep us young, right? They keep our creativity going. In fact, I'm not sure at what point in time, but we all stop drawing. You know, maybe not all of us, right? But there's a good amount of us that stop drawing or we start getting, stop writing music or poems and things of that nature. And I don't know why, but I was, th- I've been reflecting about this recently. So it's like, man, why did I stop writing music? I'm like, I really, then I'm thinking, man, I've had them look at my kid and now I'm like thinking of, these super sappy things I could write, you know, but it's still, it's cause she's like sparking my creativity again and kind of like pushing me forward. Now what, what continues and pushes you, what continued to motivate you? I, I mean, both Justin and I are really self-motivated people and we love challenges. Like we love to go figure out how to solve for really complex problems. I don't know if that's coming out of the corporate work that we do. Um, but you know, for me personally, the kids have been a huge motivating factor. Um, kind of back to your comment on creativity. I reflected and creativity has been lost in the day to day work that I do for, you know, my company in a sales role. And I used to be really creative. And so coming back to that has been incredibly motivating. It's it's fueling this side of my brain that I haven't used, I haven't tapped into in so long. The food rule, reels, you know, that we're making, um, you know, just new ways to think about engaging with customers over food. So the creativity is, is really um, been extremely motivating. And honestly, I had some fears about my capabilities in, as an entrepreneur. So coming back to that challenge of seeing if I can actually be an entrepreneur. I know I can be a really good corporate citizen, but can I really be an entrepreneur? And that also is really motivating for me. Now, as an entrepreneur, what keeps you up at night? What are those things that you think about as a small business owner that you're like, man, got to think about that again? Well, there's always a thousand things to do and 24 hours in a day and you need to sleep 
and you also have to be there for your kids and you have to do your, you know, day job if, if you have another profession that you're working on. So for me, it's about how do I think about all the things I need to get done? Onboard into FAIR as a platform for wholesale, um, bringing out new products. What does our new product rollout look like? How do we create an email marketing campaign that's going to help us really drive that direct-to-consumer business? And then I just don't have enough time in the day to do all of them. So for tomorrow, which two can I actually get done? What things can I prioritize? And how do you prioritize the highest impact things to help you really build that business? You know, one of the things you mentioned at the beginning is the first thing you did was you outsourced marketing. How important was that to kind of, because you're also mentioning there's so many hours in the day and you can only do so many things. So how important was it to outsource the marketing so you can focus on, you know, making what the salt? Incredibly, incredibly important. And actually, back to the OSU, uh, OSU Food Innovation Lab, one of the pieces of advice we got were like, hey, we have this incredible product. We want to build it at scale, right? We were just making it in our home kitchen. And she looked at us and she's like, you're two busy working professionals. When are you going to make this? And I was like, well, wh- what's the alternative? And she said, You know, there is contract manufacturing where you basically bring your product, you take your recipes, your formulations, all under NDA, you work with a contract manufacturer, and they produce it at scale for you. And that was a light bulb moment because at the end of the day, you have to be able to say, I may not have time to successfully do this and outsource as such. So we're keeping a lot of the sales um, aspects and obviously the strategy and building our channel strategy and all of the R&D behind the blends in-house, but outsourcing marketing to somebody that can do it better to me was just an easy decision. I, I know what I'm strong at and I know where we need support and getting that support is going to ultimately help propel us to be more successful. So looking in the future, we got the crystal ball out. What what's what's what do you what are we doing in the next, you know, year, five years, ten years? Where do you see the company going? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, my boss is like, Are you quitting anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, don't worry, not quitting anytime soon. You know, we wanna be a household recognized brand in your pantry, delivering incredibly flavorful spices to customers around the world. That is the vision. How long it takes us to get there, I don't know. Um, You know, I've seen a lot of companies and listened to a lot of podcasts about companies that have these inflection points as they're trying to grow and scale. There's a lot of break points during that process. You know, landing too big of a deal that basically pummels your whole, you know, manufacturing and supply chain capabilities. So I think our vision is to get to that level, that you know, top tier level in terms of uh, the retail environment in in homes across the world. But we're going to do that, I think, in an organic way, in a way that we can do without losing our identity, without sacrificing quality of the product, um, you know, keeping true to why we started this company in the beginning. What what support do you need from the community to get there? That's a great question. I mean, we, we need people to love our products and to tell us what they love. And we also need the community tell us what we need to do different. We are open to feedback because I think that feedback is an incredible gift to help you reach, you know, and maximize your potential, whether it's personally or professionally or as a business. And so we want the community to rally around us. We want to be a part of this community. And we also want to give back in the same way we receive from so many food and business, uh, food and beverage professionals in this community and mentor people that are coming up the ranks. So what, what advice would you give folks that, you know, you mentioned you had this opportunity to en- engage with the food community. What advice would you have for individuals that want to do this, that want to start to engage with our food community here in Oregon? In terms of resources, there are incredible resources out there. I think the Oregon Department of Agriculture has a website and a roadmap. They actually just dropped this. Um, I don't have the exact website, but it's Oregon Department of Ag- Agriculture, and it is a food roadmap for, for how you start a business like this. It's brilliant, and it has links to resources for co-packers. It has links to resource, if you decide to self-manufacture, what kinds of FDA, um, you know, regulatory aspects you need to consider in terms of health, um, you know, 
certifications and processes. It talks about channels of retail. Do you go wholesale through? There's all these new online platforms that are popping up like fairs because there's a massive resurgence in more of these small retailers, really well curated retailers, and they can access all these products through these platforms, online platforms. Um, in ways they couldn't have before. So I would say reach out to the start at the Oregon Department of Agriculture and look at that food map and find out where you fit on that chain. Mm. Are you still in the ideation phase? Do you need refinement in your in your recipes? Do you need to understand how to take it from a bottle of hot sauce to scaling it to thousands of bottles of hot sauce? And what do you have to do with the recipe? And what does your nutrition panel look like? You know, those are a lot of complex questions, but this roadmap will provide a number of resources to help you get started on that. And I I would also say, you know, have a passion for this. Like none of this is easy. And of course, it takes a ton of time. So go into something you're passionate about, because at the end of the day, that passion will fuel you to do the late nights, to keep packing packing those boxes, to enlist your family and friends over, pay them in pizza and wine, to really help (laughs) help you where you need, because you can't do it all yourself. That's very true. Now, what advice would you give your younger self? Like if you're looking from today, looking back, what advice would you give your younger self? I would say don't be scared to start. You know, um, trying something out and failing is uh, a lot more respectable than never trying something out. And I think, you know, we all get caught up in those fast paced lives and, you know, kind of doing what we're supposed to and and those visions and those creative areas that don't necessarily pay the bills. Those get kind of left by the wayside. And I think, you know, it's you're never too old to start. But I do I wish that I would have kind of channeled that passion and energy earlier, but you know, here I am today doing it now and I feel really good about it. Love it. Now, what is one mistake maybe that you made or one mistake that you've seen commonly make that you would love to let the guests know? Don't do this. You know, I think one of the things that I've seen is that we're planning for the future. And I think starting with having the future in mind is a really important place to start. Understanding how you scale your business is a really important thing if that's what you want. We wanted to grow this business into something much larger than we knew we could do today. And so thinking about choosing the right partnerships to make that happen, right, contract manufacturers. Um, And then the other piece, too, is the financial model is really important. At the end of the day, you can have all the fun in the world you want, but if you're losing money, it just doesn't make sense to keep pouring money into. And so understanding the complexities of who gets which piece of margin as you go through this distribution chain to get on a retail shelf or to a, you know, direct direct to consumer shipping prices are astronomical supply chain complexity is at an all time high inflation's at an all time high. You know, there's just a lot of things and. Ultimately, the model can break if you're not thoughtful about planning and, um, you know, navigating unforeseen circumstances from a financial perspective. That's a great point. There's the old saying, if it doesn't make money, it doesn't make sense. So just be mindful about that, people. Now, speaking of, you know, different locations, where can the listeners find you if they want to get some Portland salt? Farmers markets. I know we're we're talking about the Portland night market and there's a Beaverton night market coming up here soon. Check your calendars, folks, if you're interested. Where, where can they find your products? Where can they buy it? Yeah, that's great. Great. Thank you so much. So we can be found at all um, 11 Market of Choice stores. Of oh, Fox nice. Oregon. So we're in those stores in the specialty section, which I think is a great placement for us. Um, you can find us near the food and usually it's, uh, sorry, near the cheese and special, specialty like honeys and olive oils, really close to the beer and wine. So we've got, you know, good <laughs> neighbors, which is great. Um, we're in World Foods downtown in Portland. Nice. We're in a few smaller retailers across Oregon um, and Washington and then direct on Online at portlandsaltco.com we love to do you know ship directly to you we've got some really cool packaging and um you know we we ship extra fast so you'll get your product right away um and we're just really excited to reach a, a whole new audience with that nice all right you, you gotta give me the what's the favorite dish what i got some salt you gave me some salt what should i besides steak i need so what else can i got because i love steak don't worry it's going to be put on a lot of steak <laughs> okay so steak salts are flagship product but i think one of the most unique products that we have is we call it pita salt it's a zatar blend it is um, mediterranean and middle eastern influenced in the middle east and the mediterranean it's one of the you know most used common spice blends it's got thyme or or um a zatar uh, leaf itself ours uses is thyme, sumac, which is like bright and citrusy, sesame seeds, 
um, and some other things, Pacific Northwest sea salt. It is so versatile. Use it on um, lebna, which is like a strained Greek yogurt. Put it on a hummus plate. It's incredible for marinated feta or just like roasted veggies. It is an all-purpose seasoning that will blow your mind. Just it is unlocks a, a flavor profile that I think we don't commonly use. Roasted chicken. I used it the other day. We grilled up some bronzino and did a whole bronzino, which was to die for. Yes, that sounds delicious. And then, you know, <laughs> drizzled a little olive oil with the tar on top just for a flavor burst. And it's just like, oh, so good. Man, I, my mouth I, my mouth is like watering just sitting here <laughs> thinking about all the different ways. I'm very excited. Becca, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really do appreciate it. Uh, do you have any last words for our guests before you before you sneak out of here? No, thanks for the opportunity. And, you know, you can always reach out to me if you have questions about how to start a business, how to be crazy and have a profession and a side hustle and manage <laughs> kids and all that. You know, I'm really happy to help support and give back to those uh, similarly who have given to us. I love it. I love it. Becca, thank you so much for the Portland Salt Company. Folks, thank you for, so much for listening. Please follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.